Hi, how you doing? Justin here. Today we're going to be talking all about reverb. Now I'm going to be using the Boss Tone Studio and a Katana amplifier, but these concepts apply no matter what device or what pedal you're using, because it's just all about the kind of the the about reverb in general, how it works. Now I'm assuming most of you have been like in a church or somewhere like that where you get this kind of funny echoey sound uh, when you speak or when you clap. And it's not so much an echo where you hear the repeat, but where the sound seems to kind of elongate a little bit. So uh, you don't hear like echo, 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 which is obviously an echo or a delay effect. Uh, but you get this kind of longer, it's the sounds reflecting off hard surfaces that you hear those reflections coming back to you is actually what's going on there. Um, there's a whole article on my website if you want a little bit more detail about uh, the history of, of artificial reverb and exactly how it works. In this video today I'm going to be talking about the different types of reverb and exactly the way the different effects are used and what the various parameters that you've got are. So I'd suggest that you download the Verbs 1 patch from my website there and load that into your uh, Boss Tone Studio so you can play along and experiment. The bit that we're dealing with here is on the on the editor is the, the part really on the, the right hand side there, the reverb, uh, delay 2 and reverb 2, but we're not going to be looking at delay today, we're just going to be looking at reverb. You'll see there that the mode for the effects button, which is the third knob of the effects section on your Katana amplifier, are all set to reverb. It is possible to set those to delay, delay and reverb, or just reverb. And we want them just on reverb to be able to kind of, we're just checking out the different types of reverb. And I think it's important to turn all of the other effects off so you can really hear clearly what's going on with the reverb. That'll make this middle column, the delay two column, completely redundant. We won't be looking at those today. And you'll see in the reverb column, I've pre-filled uh, pre it in with three different types of reverb. The first one is called plate, the second one is called spring, and the third is hall. And this is a good kind of starting point for you to hear the different types of reverbs. Uh, plate reverb is an artificial reverb that you, was one of the very early ones. It's basically two metal plates where the sound was kind of fed onto one plate and there was like a little microphone, I'm really making it crude here, uh, but there was a little microphone that could pick up the way the metal sheet vibrated and it created a really great type of artificial reverb. Uh, there's some really great ones. The EMT plate is, is kind of famous for being the plate reverb, very lush, beautiful uh, reverb, uh, probably my favorite most of the time. Uh, the second type is spring reverb, and this is the one that's most commonly built into amplifiers, particularly Fender amplifiers have a really nice, and uh, it's actually springs in a metal box. And uh, if you've got a, an amplifier that's got a real spring reverb, if you bash it on the top, you get this kind of almost sounds like thunder effect. And that's the springs rattling around inside the little cage there. Um, but it's, again, it's a really, really lush reverb. A beautiful spring re reverb is hard to beat. Um, and the third one that we've got there is hall reverb. Now there are other ones built in, which we'll talk a bit about in a second, but hall reverb is emulating the kind of reverb that you might find in a hall. And you'll often find reverb names have, you know, names like church or hall or canyon or room or stadium or whatever. So they're, those, those names are uh, uh, suggesting the type of reverb that the, the, the artificial reverb is copying, like the natural reverb that you might get in a stadium, for example, would be a stadium type reverb. But let's just start off by looking at the difference between the plate, the spring and the hall to start off with. So plate reverb, I'm just going to play a little chord. When you're listening to reverb, a really good idea is to play just a very short chord or even muted notes. I'm going to use just this the three notes here on the thinnest three strings, like a little A minor chord. Uh, and I'm just gonna play them and just let the, the, the reverb sound decay and just listen to it for a second, particularly be helpful if you're using headphones here or nice speakers so you can hear exactly the sound of the effect. It'll be difficult to tell out your phone, I would suspect, because the, the reverb effects are all quite similar, but they've all got their own kind of character. And I think that one of the things that you want to be aiming for in this, well, not in this lesson, but after this lesson, when you experiment yourself, is being able to hear the difference between a plate reverb, a spring reverb, and, and another type of reverb. Um, we'll talk about a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but if you can learn to hear the difference when you're trying to copy a sound from somebody else, like you're trying to uh, emulate a sound of a particular recording, you'll be able to have a better idea of where, which type of reverb to choose. And as well, you'll get a better feeling for what you like when you're trying to sculpt your own sound. And I think both of those things are really valuable. So here we go. Here's the, the plate sound. Now I'm going to flicker over so that we hear the spring sound with the same settings. And now the hall sound.
Now they're all very, very different to my ear. Now plate reverb is famous for being the most lush reverb. It's very, very deep. It's got a lovely, lovely big round kind of a certain depth to it that works really well, not just on guitar, but on voices as well. Uh, it tends to be my first call if I'm doing anything kind of fancy, like atmospheric-y sort of, uh, you know. <laughs> That kind of, you know, where I'm picking out notes and I'm trying to get a little bit of a escape going, that's that's kind of, usually I'd be going looking at a plate sound. Now, the second reverb type that we've got this spring sound. Now, because uh, spring sounds were, or spring reverbs were generally found in the 60s and 70s amplifiers made by Fender, which we used a lot, particularly in soul and blues stuff, uh, we tend to have an association with those particular styles, with the sound of a spring reverb, particularly good for things like the little chips that you might get. You, you, bit honky again it's a little bit loud right now it's a little bit too much low end in that sound as well which I'll talk about uh, in a second again how when we start talking about the parameters that you've got to play with but that the spring sound it's good for that it's really good for blues as well like your kind of Stevie Ray Vaughan styley things and you, you get a bit of crunch on it's a you know again uh, when you're looking at Stevie Ray Vaughan's a good example when he's doing those really slow blueses, you get that really beautiful reverb, which I'm fairly sure is multiple reverbs working together. So he's probably got some spring, spring reverb on the amplifiers, but as well in the studio, he's adding some plate reverbs and maybe some other digital uh, types of reverb as well. I'm not exactly sure, uh, but definitely there's an element of spring and other reverbs being involved with his kind of sounds. Something again, you might like to experiment with is uh, recording your guitar. So if, you, if you're into recording, is recording your guitar dry and experimenting with layering different reverbs is one of the things that I really enjoy doing as well. So anyway, this is the spring sound for that. You hear that funny little poke it did. Now spring, that's probably... I have to investigate that. Oh, it gave a real little kind of mid-rangey honk in there. And spring reverb is a little bit temperamental, real spring reverb like that. It's, it's uh, less, because it's an organic kind of a, a, a real spring rattling around in there, you know, sometimes you get some pretty weird effects, which can be really cool. Uh, quite often uh, when I'm recording, I'm looking for happy accidents, like that kind of a sound where, where it, something just went a little bit weird. <laughs> Very interesting. I'm going to have to investigate what the hell's going on because I don't think I was playing much differently, but it suddenly goes, Wah! it gives a little squawk. Anyway, that's spring reverb. Uh, the third type we've got here is this hall reverb. Now, as I said, the, the hall reverb gets its name because it's emulating the sound of a hall. So. <laughs> Got a very, it's not as honky as a spring reverb, uh, but it's got a, a, it, it's supposed to sound like you went to see a guy playing and he was playing on the stage in a hall without reverb and that you're hearing the sound of the hall. Now, uh, when we get into these other different types, so we've got there, uh, plate, the options that we've got in a katana are plate, room, room reverb is very much like a hall, but it should sound a little smaller. <laughs> So, to be honest, I'm not really hearing that as hear sounding a lot smaller than the hall. <laughs> kind of hearing them the wrong way around. I, 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 if, if I was a betting man, I would say that the hall and the room there have been swapped over mysteriously. I will have to ask somebody about that. The last reverb on our list is modulate, which normally adds some sort of like a chorus effect into the reverb. Uh, you, I'm going to go over into the adjusting parameters here because you don't hear it so much on a... I'm not really hearing much modulation there, but... And hear it a little bit more when I'm letting the chords ring out. Just turn the reverb time right up. Just 
and the effects level right up as... Now, now I can really hear it, okay, with the effects level right up and the reverb time right up. Now, it's a pretty decent effect that I, it's not, um, it's not making me super excited, the modulate on this particular unit. I've got to say, it's, it's got a particular place, but I would be more likely to use a regular reverb and then a chorus effect in order to get my modulation. There are some other reverb effects uh, boxes that have like an effect called shimmer, is a, is a common term for it. And, and that had something that's not quite a chorus effect and it has a little bit more of a character to it, to, to my ears, just to be straight up with you. I'm not, I'm not really feeling that modulate. I think the plate reverb in, in this unit is fantastic. I think the spring, spring reverb is good, and the hall, as I said, the hall and the room, I think, have been swapped over, but uh, we'll worry about that one uh, in a little bit. So let's go back to our plate, and we'll talk about the parameters that we've got available for our reverb. So the first one is the reverb time. Now, this is measured in normally milliseconds, or this looks like it's in seconds. So if I turn it all of the way up, we've got plate reverb, which should last for 10 seconds. It's lasting a long time, not sure it's 10 seconds, but it's a long time. Pretty deep. Now you've got to be careful with having a reverb that long because remember that when you're changing chords, if I go from here, I've still got all of the sound from that first chord ringing out during the second sound. So you don't generally have reverb like that crazy long. That, that would be unusual. So I'm going to set it up around five here just as a while I explain these other parameters and uh, what's going on. The second parameter that we've got to play around with here is pre-delay. And this is the amount of time between when you play and when the reverb starts. Now, if the surfaces were very far away from you, it would take a while between when you played for the sound to go out and reflect off that surface and come back to you. I don't generally use a lot of pre-delay. I'm gonna turn it right up just so you can hear the, the effect of it if I play. And then the, the reverb's coming afterwards. There's the reverb. Again, sometimes there are instances where sometimes a little pre-delay can help kind of clara keep the sound clear. I think sometimes if there's, especially if you've got a lot of reverb on, just adding a little bit of pre-delay can help separate the notes and give them a bit of clarity at that moment that you play them. So that's the one time that maybe pre-delay might be useful. I'm not a big fan of it using it all the time, but it's, you know, a bona fide different thing. And, and again, learning what it is and what it sounds like and how it works will enable you to uh, refine your sound a little bit. So I'm going to leave pre-delay off for now just because it's, like I said, it's not really something that I use a lot. There, there are instances where it might become really useful, but it's not one that uh, I use a whole lot, to be completely honest. Okay, effects level. Very obvious, this is how much of the reverb you're going to hear. So you could have a very long reverb that's very quiet, or a very short reverb that's very loud. So that they would both have a different uh, kind of effect. I'll just turn the level right up here and just play. Yeah, that's very reverby. Reverb times are often used by people trying to create an atmosphere, particularly kind of filmic sort of things. But if you're really trying to create some space and make something really beautiful, then I think reverb, long reverb times can be really useful. But if you try and play too much, if I try and play some sort of like a bluesy lick. I mean, it's, it just gets too messy. It, does, it doesn't work properly in that way at all. So be aware of your effect level. I think that's a really important thing. Uh, the effect level is what's controlled by the knob on the actual amplifier as well. So be aware that that's what you're controlling, not the reverb time, but the, the amount of effect, amount of reverb that you're getting. Now, uh, direct mix is the actual sound of the guitar without the reverb. Now, 
it can be quite fun to turn that off. And now, especially if we turn effect level up and the direct mix down, reverb time up, all you'll hear is the reverb, but without the guitar. Now, again, not particularly massively useful, but it does give you a good indication of what actually is going on with the reverb sound itself. So you would normally have the direct mix all of the way up. That would be the standard kind of setting there. Effect level, again, it, it would actually, let's come back to effect level in a second. Pre-delay, let's put a tiny little bit on, but again, not much. And reverb time, again, that's kind of to taste. Uh, but there are a couple of other settings down the bottom here that I think are pretty important. Um, the first one is low cut. Now, Low cut is talking about the amount of low frequencies uh, that have the reverb applied to them. So we're saying here that we're going to cut the reverb on frequencies below a certain amount. Now I've got mine set quite high at 400 hertz, which is in the grand scheme of things quite high. It, it means that the very lowest notes on the guitar won't have much reverb on it. And But that's kind of what I want because I think when you have reverb on very low sounds, it just makes everything muddy. The exception would be if you're playing solo guitar. So if you're an acoustic guitar player doing like a solo guitar thing or things with loopers where you're playing by yourself, you'd probably want to keep the, the most of the spectrum of the reverb on in that particular instance. But particularly if you're playing with a band, you don't want to have a lot of reverb in the low frequencies. You won't hear it and it'll just make everything sound muddy. So I've got mine set fairly high. That would be a standard thing for me, no matter what reverb unit I'm using, is to try and get as much of the low sounds cut out of the reverb as I can. Okay, so I'm going to turn this low cut right off so you can hear all of the bass response. And you can hear now that there's a lot of reverb down there. If I turn that low cut up, well, yeah, let's go all the way up. You can really hear, especially now, it's just got so murky down there. I, I, that's that's. Yeah, I'm not into the low, uh, sorry, I'm not into reverb on the low frequency. So around 400 is where I'm going to set it. The high cut, uh, if again, uh, flat means that there's no cut in any of the high frequencies at all. Very zingy. Right up high, there's a lot of zing. Again, that, that zinginess might get in the way of cymbals or instruments like that. So you do need to be a little bit aware of it. I, I, I'd normally cut it just a tiny bit. Still a lot of zing there. If I do, if I bring it right down, you'll hear this. Now the zing's gone. Especially with the low cut and the high cut, we're just left with middle frequency. Doesn't sound very nice at all. I, like I said, I like my reverbs to have a lot of zing, so I tend to not use much high cut at all. I use plenty of low cut, not much high cut. But it's a it, that's a personal taste thing. Again, something that you might want to experiment with yourself and find, uh, you know, what type of reverb sound you like. That's really important. Um, density is well, as it says, really how dense a sound the reverb is. Um, I'm not sure how I can relate that to back to real life, but you'll certainly hear it if I turn the density down to zero. <laughs> Now turn the density all of the way up. So the best I could describe it is there's more reflective surfaces going on. So you're getting more kind of little bits of reverb coming back. Um, I've experimented a little bit with this. Um, it's an uncommon uh, parameter to have access to, to be honest. So it's, it's not one that uh, I've just been leaving it on the middle most of the time when I've been experimenting with this, uh, these different effects. But Again, you can experiment and you might find times where you really want a, you know, a bigger reverb, particularly if it's a solo piece or something like that. So in that instance, you definitely want to be looking at uh, making your uh, sounds a little denser. Now, there's one grayed out button here, which is the spring sensitivity. And to get access to that, we need to go onto the spring reverb. And you'll see now that our spring sensitivity is coming to play here. Um, now, the spring sensitivity adds a lot of different depth to it.
Switch that off. Now turn it all the way back on. On full. It's like there's more middle or something. It's, it, again, this kind of stuff, that's hard to describe to you in words because it's a sound and it, you'll be much better off listening to it. And with all of these different effects that I've been talking about, you really need to be sitting down and exploring the unit yourself and really trying to listen to hear and kind of give your own names for the way things sound, like the, the term shimmer or, or, or dead or like it's got a sock on it or whatever, you know, try and find these different terms for sounds of effects and sounds of equalization that you can start, start to name just to give you your mind a way of pegging a particular, uh, a particular effect so that you can recognize it when you hear it out. So it wasn't really until I started doing more session work that I started recording with no reverb at all because it is something that can be really cool to add at the production stage rather than at the initial recording stage. Um, you know, it, I do really like reverb, so I'm, I'm, I can be quite particular about it. So I, there's, there is a certain amount of, of uh, good vibes on committing to a particular sound and going like, this is the sound I love, this is what's going to be on the record, rather than going like, oh, we'll fiddle around with it later and then wasting hours and hours trying to, you know, get the perfect reverb again later on. So, um, and again, I, I do a little bit of uh, uh, multi-layering of stuff and I usually record with a DI out as well. So I'm able to feed a, a DI signal back into another amplifier and mix in another sound if I want when I'm recording. There's a few different uh, tricks that you've got. So where I'm going with all of that is I think you should err on the side of caution with your reverb use and tend to use a little less than you really need because you can always add more reverb later on, particularly for recording, but you can't take it off. Okay, so if you if you record with too much reverb and you listen back to it later and go, oh man, there's too much reverb and that, there's nothing that anyone can do. But if you go, well, that could do with a little bit more reverb, then it's easy solution with a plugin. Okay, so especially if you're recording, I'd err on the side of having too little reverb. And again, live as well. If you have too much reverb, things can just get a little lost. It can be a wonderful effect if you're trying to create a bit of an atmosphere. It's definitely something you should experiment with and then perhaps use it live as well to get the right kind of atmosphere happening on stage with the with your bandmates. But just, yeah, I, I would always recommend erring on the side of caution when it comes to reverb and rather than just, uh, you know, la layering it on and on and on and, you know, maybe ending up in a bit of a muddle. Reverb, of course, works wonderfully on acoustic guitar and definitely on heavy rock guitars as well with a lot of distortion. You tend to use not so much reverb in those circumstances. Like, you definitely use some, but you'd have the effect mix lower, so the, the, the effect level would be set a little lower if you're using a lot of gain. Just the, the, You tend to use the uh, long, loud reverbs when you're doing the kind of atmospheric -y, clean guitar -y things more than when you're doing the, the heavy rock thing, just as a general rule. But again, you've got to experiment, and the really good uh, little thing to do now is to try and listen to some great tracks, great guitar sounds that you really like and see if you can copy their sound, particularly copy their reverb sound. You know, all of this information and a bit more will be available over on the website, so do check out the link in the description down there and you can download that starting patch as well if you feel like it. Hope you've enjoyed this session and I'll see you for plenty more very soon. You take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.